corollary of this progress that we're seeing around the world is that the economic dominance of the West is over. And I'm sure we'll see that in the conversations with, with, the, with the panel afterwards. And the Great Recession really accelerated an ongoing, irreversible trend that way. Last year, for perhaps the first time in 200 years, emerging and developing countries represent over half of global GDP in a purchasing pricing parity basis. On that same basis, China has overtaken the United States. On an exchange rate basis, it may take another 10 years, but if we look at industry after industry, from renewable, reso uh, from renewable power to automotive to steel production, over the last five or 10 years, China has actually become the number one player. It's estimated today that three of the four, well, today, three of the four national top economies in the world are actually Asian. And in addition to centers of production shifting, centers of innovation and institutions are shifting. So if we think of, you know, the IBMs and IMFs, you know, US-based uh, in the past, well, today it's, it's DGI and AIIB. Now let's just test people's knowledge of acronyms. AIIB. Are any survey scholars here? Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So the, the uh, new initiative by China, which had an amazing uh, support from around the world to set up a Beijing-based international organization. Just like after 1945, a lot were being set up in Washington and New York. Now, DJI. It's not an international institution, although it's becoming an international phenomenon. Do you remember there was this drone that landed, that some, some drunken security guard landed on Obama's lawn two weeks ago? That was a DGI product. That was a Phantom 2 drone produced by a Shenzhen-based company led by a 34-year-old Frank Wong, uh, who is brilliant. And it's a typical case of nine years after this thing was founded in a garage or something equivalent, it's worth $9 billion. Axel Partners of Silicon Valley put $75 million into it. But it's actually money going from Silicon Valley to Shenzhen because the center of innovation for this new drone technology is all Chinese. And for the first time, almost every part of the technology is Chinese developed. It's not Chinese built, it's imagined and designed and and created in China. So the center of innovations and institution are shifting as part of this global rebalancing. As a result, you know, globalization today is no longer a debate as it was around the year 2000. It's absolutely a reality. And it's a reality not just for corporations, it's a reality for all institutions. We're seeing this now in terms of global universities, the INSEADs and so on of today. We're seeing global mining companies negotiating with indigenous groups where the indigenous groups are actually getting consultation from other indigenous groups around the world because they're globally connected. We're seeing that you know, while political democratization has experienced some setbacks in, in recent years, the democratization of knowledge and the democratization of engagement continues to go forward by leaps and bounds. You know, whether there's the Great Firewall of China or not, ideas are going across those. People's ability to interact with one another is increased at a, at a level we've never seen before. Now, as a result of that, Professor Joe Nye said that one of the greatest trends of the 21st century is a diffusion of power from state to non-state actors, not just globalization, but this diffusion. And that's extremely powerful, that's extremely empowering, it's also extremely disturbing. We're seeing that with ISIS being one of the great examples of a, terrifying examples of a non-state actor almost morphing into taking on state-like properties. Um, we see this with international crime. We see this with um, some of the challenges also around international taxation, where you actually have non-state uh, actors taking on capabilities and, and roles they go well beyond what states have been able to actually control. Now, I guess, therefore, in addition to change, I'd say the great quality of today is disruption. And um, that actually can be a very positive thing, but it's often a very disturbing thing. And part of the disruptive age, it heralds the death of defense. Intellectual property, Tariff barriers, privileged relationships, customer loyalty, none of these will protect a company from a better business model. 
And none of these will potentially um, ensure that uh, a certain state or a certain organization can be assured of actually having relevance in, in, the, in the period in the future. In a sense, people have to re-earn their relevance every day, every year. And we're seeing this, for example, uh, if we look at Canada's international economic position, for the first time in 150 years, we will not have a privileged relationship with the most powerful economy in the world. You know, before it was the UK, then it was the United States. We always had relevance by association. We no longer have relevance by association. We have to have relevance because the assets we can bring to certain situations. This will be one of the great challenges and what opportunities I'll talk about in just a moment. Now, the other element of that is with this great disruption comes tremendous stress. We're seeing that in terms of not only the unemployment levels because of the financial crisis, but some of the structural changes in employment and wage levels because of the changing nature of technology and the impact that's having on inequality, which in many Western uh, countries, particularly the United States, is reaching a level not seen since the 1920s. In the US, the median wage hasn't moved in two decades. And this is a global phenomenon. So when we at the World Economic Forum, we're looking at some of the key global risks one of the top 10 global risks identified was this issue of, of growing inequality. And obviously, in addition to the social implications of these major disruptions, are the geopolitical challenges of ensuring that the international system can accommodate these challenges, these changes. One of the biggest challenges we actually have, though, is, in a sense, the stress that comes from success. As we have billions of people coming out of poverty, as we have rising levels of income, the level of consumption, of course, is reaching sort of levels we've never seen before. And many of the projections are having to be scaled up in terms of both consumption and emission as a result of this success. And one of our greatest collective challenges today is that of the planetary boundaries. And what is clear from all the evidence of the last few years is it's now coming to a head. So at a time that we're reaching not only unparalleled but accelerating change, where we're actually finding traditional national and international leadership models are increasingly being outpaced by the rate of change, we're actually coming to a critical point in our collective development as, as a human species, which is will we over the next 15 years successfully meet these challenges? Because water levels are declining in certain parts of the world at two to three meters a year, and that just can't continue in Yemen and places in China and some parts of India without either a radical rethinking of how water is, is used, supplied, uh, applied, and managed, or having regional catastrophe. The issue of climate change isn't something we can leave for 15 years and hope to actually keep within two degrees. We will either meet this challenge or we will fail over the next decade and a half. Many of the challenges in terms of the re global rebalancing of power relationships will either be successfully addressed or will lead to massive international crises in the next 15 years. So we're actually at a point where we can't just sort of hope that we will figure out a way of dealing with these things. We actually have to collectively figure out how we get better at resolving these incredibly challenging, increasingly interrelated issues. So what should Canada be doing in all of this? And an important thing to actually take a moment on before we say what we should be doing is to actually ask, why should we care? Because, you know, it's, it's easy to say we care, but actually, if you measure caring by doing, we don't care as much as we used to, right? Our corporations are actually more continentally than globally focused. Our philanthropy tends to be locally rather than internationally focused. Our government expenditure, whether it's on development assistance, on military or diplomatic elements, has gone through a massive change in the last 20 years. And this isn't a partisan statement. This is a generational observation. From 1975 to 1995, even in times of some of the greatest deficits we've ever faced, government spending under liberal or conservative governments for development assistance never dropped below 0.4% of GDP. 
not what we had promised, but significant. Since 1995, during periods of some of the largest surpluses we've ever experienced, under conservative and liberal governments, never in one of those 20 years have we reached 0.4%. So before, never below, since, never above. So actually, if caring is doing, we don't care as much. And is that right? I mean, is that, you could say, well, you know what? We're actually in a secure part of North America. Cold War is over. It's too bad. We wish these other places well, but we have to focus on our own issues. And I'd argue that's not only morally repugnant, I think it's strategically naive. Because the world is an interconnected system. And the world is not a zero sum. It's not we get ahead, and if we get a little bit ahead, and that means somebody else doesn't do as well, you know, that's better. The world is fundamentally a negative or a positive sum dynamic system. Now, and what do I mean by that? What I mean is if you look at our, our, our fiscal situation and economic strength over the last 10 years, what has the greatest challenge been? Well, it was the international financial crisis. There were decisions made by a set of authorities and banking institutions in London and New York that had a massive effect on us. You know what? Our border didn't help us very much then. If we look at issues of um, violence, ISIS has reminded us that we don't have peace at home unless there's peace in other countries. The Air India disaster, which was our 9-11, was actually as a result of uh, intercommunal conflicts at a different subcontinent. If we look at the challenges of infectious diseases, you know, what SARS showed us, what Ebola frightened us by the possibility of, was that infectious diseases don't respect boundaries. And actually, one of the greatest challenges we collectively have in, in medicine today is the extraordinary and frightening rise of, of drug-resistant um, disease forms, in many cases, uh, whose drug resistance is a result of uh, behaviors of the pathogens in other parts of the world. Some of the most extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis coming out of, out of Southern Africa or Eastern Europe. Some of the biggest challenges we have with antibiotic resistant uh, diseases is coming out of the subcontinent of India because their antibiotics are uh, available without prescription. So actually, drug policy in India has an effect on our well-being here. That's at a negative level. On the positive level, drug development taking place in India can actually save and extend lives here. Arguably, as Asia becomes richer, we will live longer. Why is that? Because when you have aid, aging countries such as China, with a GDP now close to that or exceeding that of the United States, they're investing on issues of dementia, on issues of aging, on communicating with elderly, in ways that actually could not only benefit their populations, but could benefit ours. And one of the extraordinary things with innovation-driven development, which is the phase we're all in today, is there's huge upfront costs. But once you develop the breakthrough, you can share it at almost no cost. So a new pharmaceutical breakthrough in Asia benefits us all. A new uh, a technological breakthrough in Silicon Valley can benefit us all. So in fact, innovation is positive sum. Similarly, strengthening health systems in these areas benefits us as, as well. One of the interesting things when we were talking about some of the challenges of the last 30 years, when we look, despite the challenges, GDP has gone up per capita in all of the G7 countries. It's not been a negative sum where Japan's gone up, the United States has gone down, or vice versa. And in fact, only 27% of that increase in per capita GDP is a, com is a competitive one. Did one go up higher than the other? Almost three quarters of the increase of GDP over the last 30 years has actually been a shared one. So that's actually the reality. So we have, both from a avoiding the negative and a seizing the positive, a great strategic vested interest in actually ensuring that we collectively get through this 15 years successfully. So where is it that we in Canada could potentially make a contribution? And let me lay out some of the elements that have come up after talking with people across Canada of last year. And they really come down to sort of these three categories of engagement. First is, we can make a contribution by just who we are and what we do at home. 
the more excellent we are as a society at home, the more credible we are when we engage abroad in how we've engaged with multiculturalism, in how we've engaged with social programs in the past, uh, in how we've engaged with, um, with immigration. That is actually relevant to our ability to make a positive contribution abroad. Are we effectively a role model? And are we stepping up to truly be a role model going forward? Are we learning from the best in the world and contributing to the best of the world? That's one key element. The second key category is what we actually do. And I'm going to lay out seven areas that have come up, which I'd love to hear people's reactions to. Because this is sort of on the same level of, if you ask people what did we do in the 1950s and 1960s, people would say peacekeeping. So what's the peacekeeping contribution that we could make going forward in the next 15 years? One actually has to do with being a key hub in the global circulation of talent. The way in which we bring in skilled immigration, the way in which we have students come to, to McGill, University of Montreal, or other places here, the increasing number of people who come as summer students here for language training and also to be kind of imbued with what Canada represents is actually an extremely important part of the contribution we, we can be making to a global circulation of talent. Is there a chance to do more of that and actually make it a, a strategic focal point? A second element would be connected with that. Are we walking a talk? internationally on the things we say we believe. Key element that has come up is responsible mineral development. It's such an incredibly important part of the challenges or opportunities for many developing countries is how are the mining resources or extractive resources used. Canada has huge experience in that. 50% of the mining stocks in the world are actually traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. We have some great individual companies in this. We do not have a great collective reputation. And I think the challenge for us is, do we actually see this as a place where we are prepared to step up and say, this is a challenge, this is something that's going to be good for us, good for the world, we're going to be truly transparent in what we do at home, truly transparent and effective in what we do abroad, and that's going to be a real focal point. A third is our contribution to the resolution of these challenges of planetary boundaries, including the challenge around climate change and our ability to go further in environmentally sensitive energy extraction, but also our engagement in that global debate. Where Canada has historically played a, an important role, including with the creation of Rio, with Morris Strong, and with Brian Mulroney getting George Bush to turn up, um, can we actually reclaim that role? A fourth is on the element of development, and there, uh, one of the real breakthroughs of the last few years has been maternal, new, newborn, and child health, where Stephen Harper has actually played a personal role of leadership that when I talk to people in the UN, when I talk to others who are sometimes critical of our country in other areas, they actually give full points for a, a national leader actually sustaining engagement on an issue over half a decade and putting the funds against it. Challenge, are we prepared to step up with that? Are we prepared to complement that with the element of the family planning component? which is, in a sense, the key part of maternal, newborn, and child health, right from the first moment. And is, is the woman actually empowered to choose who, when she gets married, who she gets married to, when she gets pregnant, and, um, and uh, does she have the full support across that cycle afterwards? So that is another area of, of opportunity, building on a recognized strength we have today. The fifth element that comes up is on governance and institution building. Unlike 20 years ago when the majority of the poorest people were in the poorest countries, the majority of the poorest people going forward are actually going to be in what's called low middle income countries. Countries that actually have more than $1,000 per capita have capability to, to uh, raise the standards of living of their poorer citizens, but often don't have the governance and the institutions to do that effectively and fairly. And there is a place that we are seeing as a competent, engaged, non-colonial power being able to play an important role, both nationally and also in the renewal of international institutions. It's a role we've played historically. It's a role we can play even more significantly going forward. And it's a critically important one. The sixth is 21st century peacekeeping. 20th century peacekeeping was keeping the peace between bound, national boundaries, between countries. 21st century peacekeeping is about keeping the peace within a country. 
It's how does Nigeria actually keep the peace in a human rights constrained way. It's, it's how, how does um, uh, a Kenya or a Niger or many other places actually build the capability to be responsible, have responsible governments that are able to responsibly deliver services to their citizens, responsibly control their own territory, and be responsible regional actors. A lot of that has to do with security sector reform, it has to do with building a gendarmerie rather than necessary military, justice reform, prison reform, a very challenging but critical space. So could we be engaged in what 21st century peacekeeping would look like? And then finally, there's the, are we prepared to actually put forward our best asset, which are our best people, and to actually support Canadians to be engaged in helping to lead these different organizations within the UN, with international civil society organizations. We've historically actually played a fairly significant role, but Canadian participation there has fallen off. Is it possible for us to collectively say, just as we did with the Olympics a few years ago, where we kind of own the, own the podium, that we actually want to have our best and brightest put forward uh, in the Olympic Games, could we actually do the same thing with these international organizations? And could we actually, across a private sector and public sector, identify these people <coughs> and help prepare them to take on leadership roles within international organizations and have that be also a Canadian contribution to the international system? So that's under the element of, of what we do. The third sort of broad criteria, though, is how we do it which is, do we engage in these issues proactively, positively, working in a partnership-like fashion, not trying to impose one view of the truth, but trying to collectively understand what is the best truth within the complex reality of today's world? And are we persistent in engaging in issues, supporting institutions and organizations over time, so that when people see that Canada's committed, it's not just committed for a month or a year, it's actually committed for a decade or two decades, or as long as it takes for the issue to be resolved. And that kind of positive, proactive, disinterested approach is actually one of the hallmarks of our role as one of the few G7 countries without a colonial tradition, without a vested interest in many regions of these world, but with a very strong and recognized strategic interest in the system working. So that would be the last element in terms of what we could be contributing. It's the style with which we engage. And that style, which is trying to learn from others, work with others, bridge differences, develop new levels of leadership and new styles of leadership, is also very much what the Sauvé Foundation represents. So I thought it was maybe appropriate to end with that last part, because that is perhaps our greatest challenge. And that's also, in a sense, the great element of what Jean Sauvé's um, legacy bequeaths us here. Thank you very much.